بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Have you ever felt that it's very difficult for you to worship? Extra acts of worship, meaning nafal and supererogatory, not compulsory acts of worship, are very difficult for you to engage in. And even compulsory acts of worship sometimes are very difficult for you to engage in. Inshallah, this seminar will help you understand how to start worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more. So what we're going to talk about is three main things, inshallah. Firstly, the importance of worship. Then I'm going to share six steps for us to start worshiping, inshallah. And then once we have begun our plan, six steps for us to continue. The first thing we need to talk about is the importance of worship. The reason for this is if you and I don't have the importance of worship, we don't understand why we should start practicing this deen, why we should worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're never going to start. So we need to correct our mindsets, get ourselves to understand why we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in order to actually start. So for this, inshallah, I'm going to share a few verses of the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, وَمَا خَلَقَتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا ليعبدون. I created jinn and mankind only for my worship. So in Surah al dhariyat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that the reason you are actually created is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not only humans, but also jinn kind. So these two creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are very special in that they have free will. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us so that He can test us if we obey Him and choose His worship and obedience over His disobedience. So this is actually fulfilling the reason why you and I were created. Secondly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in Surah Al-Isra, وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الرُّوحِ قُلِ الرُّوحُ مِنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّي وَمَا أُوْتِيتُمْ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا They ask you, O Prophet, about the spirit, about the ruh, about the soul. Say, its nature is known only to my Lord, and you, O humanity, have been given but little knowledge. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us here is that you have something called the ruh or the spirit, and humanity will not be able to fully comprehend the power of the spirit. So it is truly a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He gave to you and I. And through ibadah, through worship, through turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we realize the true potential of that ruh, of that spirit, and also realize the reason why you and I were created. In another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quotes Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam in Surah Shu'ara, وَلَا تُخْزِنِي يَوْمَ يُبْعَثُونَ يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَانٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٌ Ibrahim والسلام, says, And do not disgrace me, O Allah, on the day that all will be resurrected, the day when neither wealth nor children will be of any benefit. Only those who come before Allah with a pure heart will be saved. So Ibrahim والسلام, he's making this dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, don't disgrace me on Yom al Qiyamah. That is such a day in which only those who have pure hearts will be saved. Meaning, you and I, in order for us to be saved on Yom Al Qiyamah and to have the mercy and forgiveness of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, we need to have a pure heart. And we are told in the Quran and Sunnah, the way we purify our hearts is through worship of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. These are reasons and these are verses that talk about the importance of ibadah and worship. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in one hadith narrated in Sahih Al Bukhari quotes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is known as a hadith qudsi, where it is a hadith, but Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is conveying to us what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa states that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, My servant can do nothing more effective in gaining nearness to me than fulfilling what I have made compulsory on them. The best way for you and I to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to realize the reason of our creation, to be saved on Yom Al Qiyamah, to strengthen our ruh, is to fulfill the compulsory actions. Thereafter, my slave continues to progress towards me through optional worship until I love them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you do the compulsory actions and then you start doing the extra actions, optional actions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will begin to love you. And what happens when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves us? 
when I love them, I am the ears through which they hear, the eyes through which they see, the hand through which they grab, and their leg through which they walk. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says something very amazing, that He becomes the eyes through which you see, the ears through which you hear, the, the arms and legs. What does this mean? It means that just as you have your own limbs and you use them freely for what you want, when a person achieves the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of their actions will be in accordance to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants. As if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was your own arms and legs. Of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is free from all of that. He is free from resembling His creation in any way. However, this is a figure of speech where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that you will behave in exactly the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to. And you'll want to do it. So you reach what's called the, the level of ihsan. When you do fard actions, compulsory actions, and you do the sunnah and the nawafil, this is how we get to that stage. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, If they ask me, I shall grant them. And if they seek my protection, they shall have it. So once you reach that level where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you, you'll do everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to do. You'll want to do that. And on top of that, if you make a dua, you, you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something. Whatever you want, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give it to you. If you want His protection, He's going to protect you. So this is a very high status. And this is what we say is the status of the awliya, the close friends of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is how they achieve that. So these are a few reasons why you and I should approach ibadah and worship with desire. We should want to do more ibadah and get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, why do we find ourselves avoiding good deeds? Right? Sometimes you know, we see ourselves sabotaging ourselves and avoiding good deeds and we know that we should be doing more. In the back of our minds, we want to do more, but for some reason we don't do that. So what are some reasons so that we can understand how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more and how to approach good deeds? We need to know why we're avoiding them. Firstly, it could be that we have weakness in faith. Is this lack of desire for ibadah coming from the fact that I have some doubts about my religion? Do I Have I misunderstood what Islam is about? Uh, if so, the way to cure this is to strengthen our faith through knowledge, through answering these doubts. We need to approach the correct scholars. We need to ask them uh, if our local imams are individuals that have a lot of knowledge, inshallah, we should go to them, bring these doubts and concerns to them, inshallah, they'll answer them for us. Then we'll have this aspect solved. Number two, what's the point? Maybe we feel like, why should I worship? What do I get out of worshiping extra? I'm already doing what's compulsory. Or if I'm not even doing that, then why should I worship? What do I get out of it? What's in it for me? So the way we cure this is through knowledge. We need to understand if you read the Quran and the Hadith, you'll find a lot of rewards being attributed to these actions. We just read some of them. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's stating that He'll love you and whatever you want, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give it to you. So we cure this through the means of knowledge. Number three, an immediate sense of relief. Sometimes when we don't do the extra actions, we feel good that, you know, I don't have to do anything. I can relax, I can chill. So the aspect of instant gratification, when I do other stuff, when I, you know, browse on my phone, when I'm just relaxing, when I'm just, you know, chilling with my friends, there's a sense of instant gratification. However, ibadah and worship will make you more happy in the end in the long run and if you do it enough and you practice inshallah you will find enjoyment in the actual actions themselves so how do we cure this we need to realize that through ibadah we realize our goals and we need to strive for it and we know that ibadah is going to be good for us so we cure this by forcing ourselves to do that which we know is better for us and then seeing the end result and eventually starting to like the ibadah itself Number four is not experiencing the reward. When we're doing the ibadah, it feels difficult. Like in the action itself, it feels difficult for us. If you're fasting, fasting is not easy. If you're waking up really early for tahajjud, that's really difficult. If you are reciting a lot of Quran, it takes time, a lot of focus. It's a skill. It's hard. 
So because we're not witnessing the rewards immediately, we're not having that instant gratification, we feel detached from that ibadah and it gives us these negative vibes and somewhat of a trauma sometimes if, we're, if it's forced upon us, then we don't want to revisit it. So these are some reasons why we avoid good deeds and there are ways to cure that. Number one, for weakness in faith, we need to strengthen our faith. We need to learn about Islam. We need to attend whatever programs or ask the right questions to correct all of those doubts and uh, objections and, and you know misunderstandings that we might have. Number two, if we don't know what's the point, we need to see the, the and, and read the ahadith and the Quran and see what rewards there are if we do ibadah. Of course, Jannah is there. We need to start reading about the descriptions of Jannah. Number three, no immediate relief from ibadah and more relief from not doing ibadah. We need to start thinking about the long run. That if I do ibadah today, I will be happy in the long run. If I relax today, I'm going to be sad and you know in a negative state in the long run. And number four, not experiencing the reward. If we stick to these principles, inshallah, that I'm going to share with you, eventually we will experience the reward. We will actually feel good in the ibadah itself. But that comes as a reward that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us for that patience that we undergo in the very beginning. Now we're going to go into the six steps to start worshipping. What are six things that you and I can do today? We can start planning and we can actually do these actionable steps and start doing ibadah and worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What are these six steps? I'm going to mention them in brief and then we're going to go into them in some detail. Number one. Clarify values. Number two, identify actions. Number three, rate the difficulty. Number four, plan. Number five, schedule. And number six, perform. So these are the six steps, inshallah. If we go through them systematically, inshallah, we'll be able to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number one, to clarify our values. Now, what does this mean? This is similar to what we talked about before. Why do we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Right? We said it is the reason why we were created. It is a duty upon us. We worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so we may attain forgiveness. Uh, we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make Him happy. It is a display of thanks. These are all reasons why we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are our values. If we have these values, and it all stems from the belief that there is no one worthy of worship other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the core value. Once we have these values, it'll propel us to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even more. So once we have values, it'll allow us to have goals. Right? Values are what produce goals, and goals are reached through action. So once we have the values that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is worthy of worship, I was created for worship. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me everything I have. I should be thankful. Like Rasulullah would perform so much optional salah and prayer that his feet would have blisters in them. Aisha radiallahu anha, his blessed wife, she would ask, why are you worshipping so much even though Allah has forgiven you? And his response was, Afala akuna abdan shakura. Shouldn't I be very thankful for this? Allah has already forgiven me, shouldn't I be thankful? So showing thanks for, for what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, that is a core value. Once we have these values and these understandings, then we can start producing goals. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me everything I have. I should be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thus, I should do X, Y, Z. I should do such and such every single day to make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala happy. So you make these goals for yourself. And then, in order to reach those goals, you have to start putting them into action. So if we can clarify our values, we can ask ourselves, why am I worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What is my reason for worshipping Allah? It's not because this person told me to do so. It's not because, you know, I was taught as a child to worship Allah, otherwise I'm going to hell. What is your reason? Ask yourself. And if you don't have a reason, you have to start thinking. You have to start pondering. You have to start searching within your soul and start seeing that who is Allah to you? Why does He deserve your worship? Why does He deserve your time? Why does He deserve all of these different things that He is demanding from you? If you don't have that answer, you can't move on. So you establish these values, then naturally those goals are going to form. And then in order to reach them, you have to do the actions. 
The second thing, once you have your goals, you've identified your values, you need to identify those actions. What are the things that Allah wants? And I, I want to make Allah happy. I want to be grateful. I want to show my gratitude and my thanks to Allah. How do I do that? Do I just do what I want to do? That's never the case. Like we never show thanks to a person by doing what we want to do. We always do what they want. So if I want to show thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm going to have to do something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants. Well, then the question is, what does Allah like? What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala want me to do? What are actions that please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What are the things that I can do that will make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala happy? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us in Islam, and the word Islam actually means to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's total submission. So all of the actions that we have in Islam are forms of submission. When you think about salah, salah is a bodily submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I am submitting my body to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I am putting my forehead on the ground before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I am bowing, I am standing, I am thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, submission of the appetites, right? Not just the hunger of the stomach, but controlling the eyes, controlling the ears, controlling the tongue. Controlling the mind and the heart. This is all part of fasting. Psalm or fasting. Number three, a financial submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is sadaqah, zakat, charities. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves this, that you donate to the poor. Number four, submission of my necessities. When I need something, I raise my hands and I beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like a beggar. I lower myself. I humble myself before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I ask for whatever I need. So I'm submitting my needs before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm not saying that I am capable of fulfilling those needs, that I can go and I can do whatever that I need. I'm saying that Allah, you are the one that has complete control over everything. And I need to ask you before I even engage in any way to get those things that I need. Number five, emotional submission. We are submitting our emotion to Allah. When we're doing dhikr and we're saying these words, we are thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are being emotional. We're saying, uh, Astaghfirullah, I seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness. And you're thinking about all your sins. You're saying, Subhanallah, and you're thinking about all of the grand creations and the great things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made. When you're saying Allahu Akbar, you're thinking how powerful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is and how weak you are. So this is engaging your emotion. And then we have the mental submission. When you do tilawa and you're reciting Qur'an, tilawa is the recitation of Qur'an, you are submitting the mind because you have to think about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. You can't think about other things when you're reading Qur'an. You have to be focused on the passage that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the message that Allah has given you. So all of these actions are forms of submission and this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves these actions. Now there are some other forms of ibadah but these are the major forms of worship through which we can gain the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now moving on, after you have mentioned and clarified your values and then you identified what actions you can do to reach those goals that you formed, now you can actually start making the plan. This is the formulation of the plan. You're going to rate the difficulty of these actions. Now, these actions that I've mentioned are the major ones, but they are just an example. You can choose various actions that you feel comfortable with. However, it is ideal to have many of them in your plan, inshallah. So now we're going to rate the difficulty. Now, everyone's going to differ in this regard. Here is an example. So you have various actions and you're going to rate them from 1 to 5. 5 being the most difficult and 1 being the easiest for you. So if we look at it, tahajjud. Tahajjud, the night prayers. So you're waking up maybe an hour before Fajr, maybe 30 minutes before Fajr sets in to do some extra optional acts of worship. This is quite difficult. You have to go to sleep early. You have to wake up early. Everyone else is asleep. It's not so easy. So we're going to rate this a five. The second one, dua, begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't find it too difficult, but it is kind of hard to actually sit there and make the dua. Uh, you don't have any memorized, and when you say it in your own words, you find it difficult. So you're going to rate this a two. 
The next one, tilawa or recitation of Quran. You find this very difficult. Um, you know, let's say you aim to do half of a juz, which is about 10 pages. And it's quite difficult for you to do that because maybe you're not fluent in recitation. Uh, you're not used to it. So you rate this a four. The next one is sadaqa, charity. This is easy. If you have a lot of money, inshallah, you can spend a little bit every single day in sadaqa. Alhamdulillah. The next one is sawm, fasting. So this is a little bit difficult, but it's I'm not really doing an action. I'm just not doing an action. So I'm going to rate this a three. Uh, I do feel a little bit low on energy, so it is kind of hard. But I'm not. It, it's not taking anything out of my time. In fact, I actually gain time because I don't have to eat or drink. So I'm going to rate this a three. And then the last one, the dhikr and remembrance of Allah. So for instance, saying subhanallah a hundred times, alhamdulillah a hundred times, Allahu Akbar a hundred times, whatever the dhikr you want to do, astaghfirullah, la ilaha illallah, or Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. All of these are forms of athkar. Uh, this is okay, not too difficult. So this is a two. So this is just an example of how we can rate the actions in terms of difficulty. We need to plan this out, and this is the first part of the plan. Then we actually plan it out, meaning we, we start rearranging things, and we start asking ourselves how we're going to put this into action. Firstly, we arrange the deeds according to ease. So we rearrange the things that we mentioned before. So sadaqa, it was the easiest, so we put it at one then dua, then dhikr, then fasting, then tilawa, then tahajjud. So now we know which ones are easy, we know which ones are hard. And this is going to come into play in the next aspect, which is to schedule. We need to schedule the ibadah. Now how do we schedule the ibadah? Firstly, we need to look at our own schedules. When do I wake up? When do I go to work? When do I come back? What is my family time? When do I eat? And when do I go to sleep? All of these questions we have to ask ourselves and we need to write this out. Then we find the areas wherein I'm a little bit free. When do I have free time? Maybe when I wake up in the morning, I wake up two hours before I go to work. I have two hours there. Maybe when I come back from work, I take a little bit rest, I eat, spend time with family, but then I have another two hours. So that's four hours in my day wherein some ibadah can take place. I'm not saying to fill all of it with ibadah. The more you can do, the better. But some ibadah can take place in those few hours. So, for instance, in the morning, you wake up at 6 a.m., depending on winter season or summer season, when Salatul Fajr is. Uh, from 6 to 8.30, let's say we're free. You perform Salatul Fajr, now you have time for adhkar. You have time for recitation. You have time for different forms of ibadah. Then when it's 8.30, you start going to work. Work is at 9, let's say. And from 9 to 5, we're working. So that entire period is taken up. Then when we come back from work, let's say we don't, the commute isn't too much. So we have about an hour to eat and to rest. And then we have family time. So we should not sacrifice on family time. We should definitely spend time with family. And that is a form of ibadah as well. Uh, especially when we have the niyyah of pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through it. Finally, we have about two more hours at the end of the night where we're a little bit more free. So in the beginning of our days and at the end, before we go to sleep, we have some time to do ibadah. So now we need to choose these moments to fill in our schedule. We need to write out the schedule so inshallah we can do uh, whatever ibadah we want to do at that time. So if you want to fast, then it doesn't really affect this. You just have to wake up a little bit early for the suhoor. And then when you come back from work, you can have your iftar. If you want to do tahajjud, you need to wake up a little bit before fajr comes in. If you want to do qira'ah and recitation of Qur'an, perhaps that can take place in the mornings, uh, when you're free in the mornings. If you want to do adhkar, you want to do Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, these things can happen at night. So in this way, we can have a regimented system of ibadah carefully planted where we need it. The final step is just to practice. Put it into practice. Now you've, you've made the plan. You need to now put it into practice. Regarding practice, I have a few tips. Also six tips, but inshallah, I'll try to go through them very quickly. 
and this will discuss what things we should keep in mind when we are doing ibadah. Some of them are in regards to pitfalls and how we can avoid them. Firstly, we need to take one task at a time. Don't think about your entire day that you have in front of you. That, that's a lot of tasks. You woke up for tahajjud and now you're getting overwhelmed. I have to do qira'ah of Qur'an. I have to do this much adhkar. I have to give this much in sadaqah. I have to fast on, on Mondays and Thursdays, etc. This might overwhelm you. Just think about the action that you're doing at the moment. Just do the, the tahajjud if you're waking up in the morning. And that's it. Don't even think about anything else. Just focus on that one action. Don't think about the fact that I'm gonna, I'm planning to do tahajjud for the rest of my life. This is overwhelming. Just try today. Try tomorrow. If you don't wake up tomorrow, no problem. The next day is there. One action at a time. One step at a time. Next, establish the minimums. When you are doing optional acts of worship, you want to stay consistent. How do you stay consistent? by taking each one of those acts of worship and asking yourself how much can I do on a daily basis without fail from today onwards till the day I die there there is an amount that I can handle every single day if it's Quran one page of Quran can I do this every single day of my life of course if I'm very sick that's an exception but as long as I'm normal and healthy can I read one page every single day Maybe I could do more. Maybe that's five. Maybe I could do more. Maybe that's ten. But if I'm doing a juz a day, I don't know if I can handle that for the rest of my life. So choose a number that you are comfortable with. How much adhkar can I do from now till the day I die? Every single day. How much adhkar can I do? A hundred times la ilaha illallah. I think I can handle that. That's like five, ten minutes. So you ask yourself regarding all of these things. If you want to give sadaqah on a daily basis. Now there's different ways to give sadaqah. You can do it on a daily basis. You can do it weekly. You can do it monthly. Uh, but if you're going to do it daily, how much can you handle without it being a burden on you? I can give $1 every single day of my life. That way I can give something in sadaqah every single day of my life. So we establish the minimums. Once you've established the minimums, you stick to it or the rest of your life the rest of your life but it's so little that it won't really affect you too much and you start gauging yourself you ask yourself and you you monitor yourself let's say after a month you look back at your records which we're going to talk about soon how to uh, write down and, and track all of your amal and your good deeds you look at this record and you see that wait i actually have been dipping below this minimum that tells you that that is actually not your minimum. You need to recalibrate, lower that standard that you have raised for yourself. Put it to a level where you can handle. If it's one line of Quran, one line of Quran, if that is how much you can handle every day, that's what you can handle. That's your minimum. So you establish those minimums. Now, if you start noticing that every single day I'm doing way more than my minimum, I'm, you know, I've, I've told myself that I'm going to do one page a day, but for the last three, four months, I've been doing five pages every single day without fail. So then let's say you can, you know, this is subjective, but every three months or so, you can revise and you can see what a new minimum can be. What target have you been consistently hitting and doing even more than that? And then you make a new minimum for yourself. Now you have upgraded. You've gotten used to those a'mal, those good deeds, and now you're ready for the next step. And you can do this for each category. So this is what it means to establish the minimums. And after a few years, you'll see how much you've grown. Next, we have the power of rewards. Now we know these actions that we're going to do, inshallah, are rewardable. And in the hereafter, there's going to be mountains and, and just a lot of reward in store for us if we do these extra acts of, acts of worship. However, in the dunya as well, we should reward ourselves. So buy yourself something nice. If after a month you see that you've been consistent, treat yourself. Don't go too, you know, over the top. Something uh, that, that you can enjoy. And it could be an item that you buy. It can be, you know, spending time with friends. It could be going out and eating something. Halal, of course. Um, this way you will reinforce that, those positive feelings. And it'll encourage you to do more. So treat yourself when you do good. 
The next one is if you end up not doing what you planned, you were incapable of fulfilling those plans that you made. Be compassionate. Be soft on yourself. You know, sometimes the way we speak to ourselves, our, our inner thought process, our speech, our inner speech is so negative that we would never speak like this to another human, not even our enemies. And we should be friends to ourselves. We should be compassionate. So if we fail to do one of these actions, we shouldn't step on ourselves. We shouldn't curse ourselves. We shouldn't say you're useless. You can't do anything. Say, Astaghfirullah, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, do the doors of tawbah are always open. The doors of Allah's mercy are always open. No matter what I've done, no matter what I missed out on, I can always do better. At least I'm a Muslim. At least I'm trying. At least I have this concern. At least I love Allah. So be compassionate. And treat yourself as if you were another person. If, if your friend missed out on some a'mal and they're beating themselves up because of that, what would you say to them? You'd say, you know what, you, there's, tomorrow's coming. It's going to be okay. Just try again. No problem. You know, I don't know what you're upset about. MashaAllah, that how many people in the world are even concerned about doing ibadah? And you're over here beating yourself up because you couldn't read Quran. So say those same things to yourself. And see, inshallah, this will be a great source of motivation. The next one we have is to make yourself accountable. Have some sort of means to push yourself to do these actions. And one of the best means is to have a buddy system. Now, there are some disclaimers and caveats. If you have a buddy, you don't reveal your sins to that person. We only reveal our sins before Allah. We talk about it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask Him to forgive. And He knows and He's watching. But you can, and I'm going to show you how to record or an example of how to record the a'mal. Uh, you can show that to your friend, someone who is also embarking on this journey with you. And you guys can swap your charts at the end of the week and then uh, talk about it or, or just look at it. This way you'll feel self-conscious that you know, someone's going to look at these a'mal. So I need to get them done. Now someone might say this is no ikhlas in it if you're showing it to someone. Well, sometimes in the beginning, we need to start off this way. And eventually, once it becomes a habit, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless us with ikhlas. Ikhlas is not a choice. Ikhlas is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses us with. So we need to work for it. So this is a means by which we can earn ikhlas, inshallah. And finally, we have track your progress. So you need to track your progress. This way, you can actually look back and it'll actually motivate you to actually do more. So now, how can you track your progress? I have a sample chart here. So we have on the top, from left to right, the different a'mal. So you have charity, sadaqah, dua, begging Allah, dhikr, remembrance of Allah, psalm, fasting, tilawa, which is recitation of Quran, and tahajjud, which is the early morning prayers or the, you know, the night prayers, we can say. And on the left side, you have the days of the week. So we put in green those actions that we were able to do on that day and in orange what we could not do. Very simple, right? You can put in more details. So let's say on Monday we failed to give sadaqah, we forgot. But we did dua, dhikr, we fasted on Monday, uh, we, we did tilawah, we did tahajjud. And for fasting, you can see Mondays and Thursdays we only fasted because those are the Sunnah days, unless it's the 13th, 14th, 15th of the lunar calendar, the, the lunar month. Then the rest of the days we did Sadaqah, Dua, some days I did, some days I didn't, Dhikr, some days I did, some days I didn't. So this is a very simple way. And you can actually make this chart on like Microsoft Word or something like that, print it out every single week, and then fill it in. This way you can see all of this, you can track it, and if you're showing it to a friend, a buddy, or a sheikh or someone you know that is uh, close to you, uh, you'll want to have all of it green, or you you'll want to have a check on all of them. You can get more detailed by writing in what dhikr you did, how much tilawah you did, how much tahajjud, how long was your dua, five minutes, ten minutes. You can put all of those details in there, but this is a very simplistic way to look at it. Then after a while, once you start saying you're doing all of them, you will be very hesitant 
to miss any of them in the future. You won't want to miss a single time because you're on a streak. So this is the power of having a streak and you'll only know that you're on a streak when you record all of them. So I hope this was beneficial. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us tawfiq to start practicing the deen, to start getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to start following the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta sami'ul alim wa tuba alayna innaka anta tawabur rahim. Accept from us our Lord. Indeed, you are the hearer, the knower and pardon us for you are the partner, the merciful. If this was beneficial to you, please do remember me in your du'as. Jazakumullahu khayran. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.